As part of our Your New Mexico Government project with media partners at KUNM and the Santa Fe Reporter, we're always interested in policy that affects how you interact with the women and men who represent you. There were a handful of so-called good government bills this session that met different fates. Key among those that passed was a bill that would open up the capital outlay process to see which projects lawmakers supported with their public funds. And Jessica Onsuras, how, how might knowing what senators and representatives are prioritizing help both the media and the public? Well, these are taxpayer dollars that we're talking about. Let's just start there, right? The public has a right to know how they're being spent, where they're being spent, and how how our legislators are prioritizing um, dispersal of those funds. That's probably the primary po point in this entire debate. Um, the the way that the system is set up before is we wouldn't have uh, we wouldn't have access um, to that knowledge. They could say we're going to send funds to such and such organization, such and such um, area, but there would be no explicit. Um, reveal to the public of where that was going. Um, as journalists, we're always looking for transparency. I think that is a key to keeping our democracy safe and progressive and ongoing. Um, not being able to get to that information is um, was a was a huge, huge black hole for us. We were, tr we were trying every which way to actually be able to access that um, from asking for legislative emails, which are covered, um, um, well, not considered in some areas, um, not public information. Then we were also um, taking on lawsuits. Um, we had conversations with local legislators to ask if they would themselves reveal what they were um, giving those funds to. In many cases, some did. Um, and I think that I want to give big kudos to our rural legislators who um, voluntarily um, last year gave gave their list of capital outlay fundings um, out to the public. So I think um, if we're coming back to this this topic, it's really about the need to know where our tax dollars are going. Andy, um, you know, look, the third, a third, a third thing that we've been under here for capital outlay since forever seems so cumbersome and so inefficient. And everyone seems to know it, but we didn't know how to take that next step to get there. What, what was the sense of the, of the debate in this time around? Um, I think it might be just about that time. Uh, I think somebody mentioned earlier, uh, uh, you know, this um, sort of takes years to get things done. And mm -hmm. I think uh, we're just now getting out of this culture of, you know, people do things secretly and this is the way it's always been done. So why buck that trend? And um, yeah, I do think, uh, back to Jessica's point, kudos goes to those rural lawmakers who are saying, yes, this is the money I'm pulling for. We have just so much history of uh, lawmakers sort of trying to do favors for their their friends in their districts, and we just, you know, didn't connect the dots. And so I think we're, we're sort of coming out of that now. Yeah. Dan, it's kind of the same question, essentially, but... You know, to you, does seeing behind the curtain encourage better uh, capital outlay planning and more accountability? I mean, you know, operative word there, encourage, <laughs> not guarantee, encourage. You know, how far can we get down the road with what we have on our hands now? Yeah, we'll see. I, I think this is a, a positive step, uh, that kind of disclosure. And, but it's, it's not an overhaul of the capital outlay system. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the process is still going to work the same way. Uh, there's been a lot of concern about inefficiency and a lot of money sitting there that gets allocated and then isn't spent. Um, so th this might put a little more of an onus on, on legislators now that we can all see which projects they're funding, you know, that, hey, if all these projects you funded didn't move forward, maybe you need to coordinate a little bit better with local governments or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it was interesting to me to see af after debating this issue for a few years and this year, the bill, you know, sailed through. I, I, I don't know, even know if it got maybe one or two dissenting votes, but I think clearly their legislators felt pressure to to at least kind of take this step and and we'll kind of see how that works and, and if additional changes need to be made. Yeah. Inez, you know, the legislature also passed a redistricting commission bill. It'll require consultation with tribes and prohibit considering political makeup or of districts, among other things. But it will allow lawmakers to draw their own maps instead of picking from a handful of commission sets forward. Is this really meaningful reform? Yes, I believe it is because um, it's the first time that someone outside the legislature draws the maps to begin with. So they're going to have a palette to start with. And I do think that embarrassment and shaming uh, can work. So if, for example, the legislature rejected all the maps and, and 
did horrible gerrymandering, they would A, get sued, which no one wants to see, and B, everyone in the state who is in favor of good government, and that's you know up and down from newspapers to groups to individuals, would embarrass them. I mean, Speaker Egoff was against this bill until I think he got a lot of pushback and he found a compromise, which included the legislature being able to have a say. And I think that compromise is important also because that's sort of in the Constitution. So the compromise they ended up with get citizen involvement is independent, involves communities throughout the state, is transparent. And it keeps legislative consultation at the end, which you could argue is in the Constitution. So it's not going to be sued if the governor does sign it. Mm -hmm. That's I I appreciate you bringing that point up, too, about the constitutionality. It's not often talked about. Uh, Jessica, on on a similar note, we also didn't see measures to pass professionalizing the citizen legislature or to require more disclosure from lobbyists. Why is ethics and transparency so hard for us? What's going on here? I think it's just, again, to that, um, what we've been discussing before is that longstanding um, tradition and culture of, of these two bodies. Um, transparency is um, is hard. It's hard work. You really have to have systems in place. Um, you have to look at it as, as something that's fair across and, and easy to execute because um, we're talking about, you know, a lot of a lot of information here. Um, the question that you you know, why is it so hard for us? Um, there's a lot of pushback as well. There are some um, uh, bodies, people out there who would like to keep some of these things, as you said, behind the curtain. It's just um, easier for them. Um, but also, I think that one of the things to note in this conversation is how much more we're talking about transparency and access, um, not only for journalists like us, but for the public themselves who are interested in finding out more about how these, um, how their local and state government work. Mm-hmm. Annie Lyman from the Mexico Political Report. Um, interesting. Open primaries failed, um, all, as did holding primaries for special elections, like the CD1 race we have coming up for Deb Holland's seat. Do we have an effective primary system now, or does it too heavily favor insiders as it stands? As as far as the uh, the special election goes, <clears throat> excuse me. It's it's one of those things that really only comes up in a, in, you know, I don't think anybody ever thought about looking at that law until, of course, it, now it comes up that, you know, how often does this situation happen? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's kind of split. I think that there's some some folks that uh, would rather it stay the way it is because you've got candidates who are just independently wealthy, right? right. They can come out of the gate and they can sell themselves to the central committee as the person with the most money, the easiest, you know, the, the fastest fundraiser. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, on the other hand, sort of in, in generally speaking, yeah, I think a lot of people are are saying, you know, we don't even get to pick this person. Right. So now, uh, you know, and it goes back to the open primary thing, which, by the way, I think is another one of those things that's going to take a few more years to, to work out. It's just sort of the, the slow burn, yeah. so to speak. Dan Boyd, last uh, last word for you on that on that same subject. We got about just about 30 seconds here. Yeah, just a couple quick ones I was going to mention was, you know, the state did recently create a new ethics commission, also passed some more disclosure rules for uh, independent expenditures. So I I think sometimes uh, there's a sentiment that we took these big steps, let's give it a few years, see how they work. And if we need to come back, make some tweaks. But uh, this is an ongoing conversation. And certainly, you know, we haven't seen the last of it. There you go. We're out of time. Thanks to each each of you for your thoughts today and for your work during this session.